Welcome back, everybody. This is Brian from Breaking Down Security. Part two of our discussion with Noid and Dave Dietrich, uh, Noid being uh, Brian Harden, is this week. We're going to be talking about uh, some of the things that people tend to implement in applications without first thinking about things that they maybe probably should put at a higher priority. Um, But before we get to that, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, from last week's show, we talked a lot about Keybase, which um, I know a lot of people actually sent me DMs and stuff. And was like, why do you hate you know security so much? They're trying to be secure and everything. I love Keybase. I think it's great. Uh, Keybase file system is is awesome. I'm I'm actually using it now instead of what I used to use, which was Sync Thing. Uh, it was uh, it used to be called BitTorrent Connect, allowing you decentralized file sharing across. Uh, uh, multiple machines. I love using Keybase in that respect, and I love that uh, Keybase has one of the more user-friendly PGP implementations. Um, it's just the cryptocurrency soured me on it, and you know the some of the some of the things that they've implemented versus you know you know having dark mode before you have you know the ability to block people in a chat program. Just just some simple peccadillos that uh, I wanted to you know, highlight. And, and that's what we're going to see part of part of number two here, where uh, part two here, where we're going to see some implementations or things where people thought that they were creating security when in fact they weren't. Uh, one other announcement we have uh, besides uh, Seattle 2020 is going to be April 18th in uh, Redmond, Washington. It's going to be at building 92 on the Microsoft campus. Apparently this is a larger uh, building space. They used to have it in the commons the last, I think, three to four years. So this is a much larger space. They're going to have lunch. Uh, they'll have lightning talks. So if you want to do a lightning talk versus having a CFP, you can do that. They also have a CFP call for papers. You can go to B Sides Seattle. That's B Sides and Seattle. So there's two S's. Don't get that mixed up. Dot com, and then you can go to their Google Forms and submit your CFP. It closes on January 31st, 2020. It opened on the 6th. So actually as of, what is today, the 17th. So it's been open for about 11 days. I recorded this on the 17th of December. So uh, there will be a chill space. They do mention a new location with demand from last year. We moved to a larger space, expands our villages, hosts more talks. I do know they have a great lockpick village. They have a soldering village. Uh, usually you get, um, as it's been in the last couple of years, they give you the badge and you can like solder all the little lights and everything on it and make it work. And it's really awesome. Uh, they do have a safety team. So they do have a co- uh, point of contact for any safety concerns or, um, and I do believe they have a code of conduct as well. So if you uh, have any questions about that, they're also looking for sponsors. So if you, uh, uh, have uh, questions about how to uh, join them. If you are interested in donating money, you can go to, uh, looks like, let me see, their website on the B-Sides portal says, uh, interested in sponsoring B-Sides, contact b Seattle at gmail.com. So if you're interested in doing that, they go all the way up to $1,000, uh, all the way down to, looks like post-conference reception for $3,000, but they also do a $100 a bit a bit so um that's pretty cool um be sure to check that out it's um you know if you missed besides portland a couple months ago uh or you know you can't get out to cansec west in march this will be a really great uh, opportunity and the weather will be fantastic here in the spring uh, in the pacific northwest uh one last thing uh one other conference i don't know if i mentioned this at the end but i'm going to ahead and do it again layer eight conference is still um happening June 6, 2020 in Rhode Island at the Rhode Island Convention Center. If you're looking to sponsor a conference and you don't want to do B-Side Seattle, you can go to layer8, the number 8, conference.com, uh, and email sponsors at layer8conference.com. Uh, if you are looking for a sponsorship, perhaps, they are doing diversity sponsorships. So if you follow WorkshopCon on Twitter and tweet why you're interested in social engineering and OSINT topics, because Layer 8 is predominantly social engineering and OSINT conference, uh, tell them why you're interested in social engineering and OSINT and send the hashtag send me to Layer 8, the number 8, and they will select some folks from those tweets uh, with an emphasis, of course, being on underrepresented or minority groups. So, um, you know, anybody can anybody can apply for a scholarship, but they will try to give 
uh, as much preference as they can to minority and underrepresented groups. So there you go. All right. Well, um, that's all I have for the week. We're going to go ahead and get started with Dave Dietrich and Noid. See you next week. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a discussion with B. Hughes about uh, realistic threats in your environment. The vast majority of companies are not being targeted by APT1 or, you know, Fozzie Bear or, uh, you know, Green Kermit or whatever the hell you want to call your named uh, adversary. Uh, and in, in fact, it's actually Billy Bob from sales who's clicking on every link or the HR folks who are, you know, clicking on resumes because they have no choice. They have to. And they got macros in them and all kinds of evil shit. Um we, we were talking about, um, you know, security failures and implementation and, uh, you know, some of the things that happened this week, uh, it, I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. You've got Atlassian allowing for, you know, a legitimate TLS uh, certifi- certificate, uh, security to actually drop that O day on Twitter, uh, which was, that was beautiful. Funny. Oh my God. She, uh, she, or he, uh, they did it, uh, inadvertently. I don't, I only think, uh, maybe, no, maybe yeah. you could explain really? what that means. So basically <clears throat> I don't know what Tay was looking for, but Tay posted that screenshot and almost within minutes, Tavis Ormandy of Google project zero chimed in and was like, Hey Tay, you know, you just dropped Ode. Which, of course, you know, Streisand effect immediately. Everybody's like, what? (laughs) (laughs) After this thing. Well, they have a few followers. And and it turns out it's, uh, I'm not totally familiar. I'll be be honest. I absolutely despise Jira and Confluence. Mm. Um, I use it on an almost daily basis and it drives me nuts. But um, as far as I can tell, whatever this app was, basically they put the private key in with the app. Which once you uh, once you can extra- extract that private key, you can start doing all sorts of man in the middle goodness. I'm trying to find the uh, the post. Anyway. And, I'll, and I'll give I'll give Addisland credit. They immediately jumped on it and were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> Pulled it and went and tried. I don't know if they fixed it yet, but they immediately got on it. They they immediately they didn't they didn't do what so many companies do and spend a week fighting you. Yeah. On it, they just came out and said, "Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, done pooch that one." And we'll get this fixed immediately. Yep. So the um, so it says an interesting interaction took place when Swift on security pointed out an odd DNS name Atlassian dash domain dash four dash localhost dash connections dash only dot com with the description that allowed a secure HTTPS connection to a service running on localhost. So yeah, yep. Tavis pointed out that a valid HTTPS cert installed on localhost means that Atlassian must be shipping a private certificate, and that. Valid, that would be a valid HTTPS certificate. So you, you've got everything you need to spoof any kind of, you know, Atlassian, in this case, the Atlassian domain. So if anybody has their stuff, so let me, let me see if I explain this right. If anybody incorrectly configures their Atlassian to reach out, they could potentially go to a, a site that looks like what they're looking for, but it's actually yep. could be a bad site. Yeah, but is attacker controlled? Right. This isn't a whole lot different than the Lenovo issue last year, mm-hmm. where they were shipping one of the, I almost call it spyware, but it was official stuff. But yeah, they did the same thing where yep. they, they had a private key and they had a private cert in there. Right. And once you had the private cert, you could do all sorts of interception or man in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, and that in turn kicked off the community, basically hunting through software all over the place, looking for other things that had dropped a, 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 a private cert onto yep. the user desktop as well. And I think a couple more products got found. I think Dell got caught up in it. Yeah. A few other places did too. And yeah. again, these places responded to it and said, crap, okay, we'll fix. Right. So like last week when we were talking about the key base stuff, um, Superfish was the thing you were talking about with the IBM, the Lenovo stuff, but yeah, you know, yeah. they came out, they communicated correctly. And like we were talking about with Keybase, where their communication <clears throat> could have been a, a, a little better, but um, you know, Atlassian's like, yep, we're going to fix it. There's already a CVE for it, whatever. They did what was necessary to, you know, fix this as soon as possible. Um, uh, so, okay. So the reason I wanted to do this show this week is There's a lot of companies out there that seem to want to do things that will help their customers but sacrifice security. Uh, The Atlassian thing was probably good for a reason. There was a valid reason or a valid use case for it. 
They just didn't think along the lines of how it would be abused or or what have you. Uh, there was another one that just came out this week about um, uh, pen practical pen tester labs where they're oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they store passwords in the clear in a database and they double down on it by saying, well, you know, we set the, you know, we set the, uh, the pat. Oh, did they, he delete the, oh, I think he deleted the tweet. Oh man. Right. I think he deleted the, the original tweet, which came out. So, uh, practical pen tester lab is a, like a, a CTF or somewhere where you can go to learn how to do pen testing. Uh, you sign up for an account and then they send you a password that's in clear text over email. Um, the idea is they argued that there's no, um, you know, it, it, it's ultra secure because we're the only ones who control that. And uh, other yeah, people. And their argument basically boiled down to, <clears throat> well, it's not your password. Right. Right. You know, right. so that way if it got pat, you know, and it's like, and yeah, and, and true on some, if I, if I use the same password I use for my online banking and it gets popped, then yeah, I could be in some, but that, that's, that's kind of on me to practice good security, mm -hmm. but they just, the more, the very community they were trying to reach out to was trying to educate them about why they shouldn't do this. The more they argued with the very community that they seek to, you know, make money from. Right. And that was weird to me that they kind of doubled down in front of the InfoSec community on this particular thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the there, I mean, we've seen many examples of this where they're actually you know doing these things. T-Mobile Austria was something similar. It's like, well, we want to be able to help customers with yep. password, you know, to be able to recover their passwords or whatever. So we, you know, we keep the first five characters of the password. And unfortunately, if, you know, a user's password starts <laughs> with pass W and then there's three asterisks or whatever for the customer service person, um, you know, that was a, that was an example of very bad communication as well. Uh, I have a link uh, that I'll put in here to the to the PC mag. That was back in 2018. Can you believe that was over a year ago? Anyway. Yep. Um, so, yeah, some of the some of the things I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, who is the champion for security? And, uh, we got some feedback from somebody, uh, who, uh, I follow who's native, uh, to Seattle here. Uh, I like the discussion about security and DevOps teams with B Hughes in your recent podcast. When you mentioned you're taking the PMP for agile, I was surprised you did not mention the term product owner because I'm taking my PMP, not for agile. Uh, you were asking who cares about security that you as a security guy could talk to B mentioned that it was a stakeholder, but in an agile process, the product owner is the team's advocate for the stakeholders. Uh, you also mentioned pro PM is in project manager in an agile world. PM roles minimized. Actually, the PM is moving away entirely, ideally, in favor of empowered teams. Uh, so I'm reading this, and he's explaining to me what uh, empowered teams are, which I hadn't heard of because I don't work in a DevOps environment. Um, my my question from his uh his requirement is he's like, is empowering, empowering them to take time and bear costs of using security tools prior to release and during system operation is what he's looking at at his own company right now. He's got 4,000 odd people at his company. My thing is if the product owner is not considering security a priority or a requirement, who champions security in a DevOps environment? That's a good question. Especially, when it's, good especially question. when it's an empowered team. And, you know, developers are not seeing security as a feature like Noid had mentioned last week. It's mentioning it as a, a cost loss or, you know, it's not a feature. It's a problem that we have to solve. And you talked about that in your in your B-Sides talk. It's like, don't treat it as a problem. Treat it as an upcoming feature or something like that. Um, so what do you do in an environment like uh, an empowered team or where there's no PM uh, there's no real requirements or anything for security. And I'm going to talk to the filthy dev first, Mr. Betcher, because uh, he's a filthy developer. How do you deal with uh, with that when, when security <laughs> isn't a requirement? I'm just kidding. I love you, man. How does who deal with it? The, the company itself or the developers? Yeah, any, anybody, because there's nobody championing security at this point. It's like the devs are like, I need dark mode. I don't need to be able to block people on teams, you know, uh, being added to yeah. teams. Dark mode's important. Screw, you know, screw being able to restrict access to things. Well, it's where the money is. Once security becomes such a hassle that it's costing your bottom line, then you start doing security. I was going to say these it's, new it's features sales. Are gonna make, yeah, these new features are going to make you money. So that's what your focus is going to be on. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always where the profit is. Mm. It's also the reward model as well. Like back when I was at that, that big software company in Redmond, uh, one of the things I noticed with the devs is they get rewarded on features, Mm. you know, don't get promoted off of fixing bugs. You don't get promoted working in sustainment. You be the person that says I shipped that feature in the new version of blank that everybody loves. It's what, it's what made it the killer app. Mm. And that in turn gets you promoted. That gets you a good bonus. That gets you all that stuff. And so as long as that reward model continues to focus on shipping badass features, then the devs don't have any incentive to change because if anything, they get penalized for stopping work on that badass feature to go f- do security stuff. Yeah. And that's how and you, you know, your your code could be stomped on all day long or fuzzed to to a hacker's con- heart's content, right? As but you still get paid for that feature you put in, even though it's from a security perspective, crap code. Yeah, because as long as you can keep that house of cards standing to get that feature out the door and then you move on to another team, that's a statement's problem. Uh, When somebody closes the door too fast and the house of cards falls over, that becomes a sustainment problem, not yours. Right. Dave, do you have any insights on this? Have you worked with developers in the past? I know you said you've you've, you've done some technical stuff. Um. Well, I I tried really hard with my last project to make sure that everybody was developing things with a high degree of security involved. And it does seriously impact moving forward. I just get really cynical and frustrated that, you know, one of the things that was touched on here was default passwords, making it easier for support to be able to recover access to a customer device. Uh, The Morris Worm used default passwords in 1987. And every piece of malware that I've looked at since then that has anything to do with passwords Mm -hmm. has a very, very small subset of common passwords. There's still a problem today. Mm. And I, the the cynical, yeah, Mirai and all the follow ons like root, root, admin, admin, no password whatsoever. Like so many devices, IOT, makes this worse because the margins are so small that you end up really quickly developing really crap stuff in order to make enough profit off of the large number that you're putting out there. The cynic in me just wants some tech savvy lawyer to start doing massive class actions all over the place to push the responsibility to executive level people and companies Mm -hmm. because if you just keep doing this rush to the bottom, maximize profit, minimize cost, come out with features as fast as you can, it's just going to get worse and worse over time. Mm. I hate the idea that it will, but how do we flip it? Well, so uh, this goes back to some of our discussion last week with the, the uh, venture capital folks. Um, That's all about first to market or getting the the cool hotness out there before. So, it, it, venture capital in many cases is not good for security. If they see a cool product or something that will fit a niche market or fit something that is a perceived uh, lack, uh, they'll throw you $10 million and then, you know, get, get it out there as soon as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the cost and the friction of doing things in a more secure way makes it really hard to sell secure products. Hmm to sell services regarding security. Right. Um, so I, I put in the show notes here, the CIA triad, which for those of you who are going through your CISP is confidentiality, integrity, availability, but where does the business goals fit? So, you know, if you're doing security and you want to do that triad, where did the business goals fit? Or is that a separate whole, you know, triangle that doesn't exist? Well, I kind of hate just, the flippant CIA triad description because people, I I just commonly see this language problem that we have the use of the terms breach Mm -hmm. intrusion compromise or uh, uh, I I like to look at compromise of integrity or availability or confidentiality Mm -hmm. of information or information systems. They lead to each other. They sometimes go in series 
if you focus on availability, compromise of availability, then you start thinking, well, how do I harden my services against distributed denial service attacks Mm -hmm. or ransomware, which is in compromise of integrity. And if it happens to be system files, that compromises availability of the entire system. So things like the ACDC Act, where they use the term breach and persistent intrusion, make it difficult to fit in things like DDoS. DDoS is not a persistent intrusion. (laughs) If you're going to grant people the right to go hack back, go use active defense measures, then how and when are those things applied? Why are you focusing on hacking back rather than hardening in the first place? Right. I I don't see those kinds of decisions and conversations happening with executive level people. Mm. Well, yeah, I've I've heard executives say, well, are we are we able to catch the stuff that no one's ever seen before? And I'm like, wait a minute, you're talking about <laughs> the most advanced shit that's out there when you've got RDP open to the internet that you haven't closed <laughs> yeah. yet. You know, yeah. crap like that, right? How come it's you just... can't catch the things that everybody knows exist? <laughs> right. Right. Do that first. How about? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It comes down to the basics, <laughs> right? So, um, Noid, you work with a few developers. What What is it like for you being? I mean, you, you do you manage them? Let Let's Let's discuss your role first. You, you're not in an empowered team, right? <laughs> you're You're a PM or you're a, a manager or dev manager, some type. I'm a I'm an engineer. Oh, okay. Well, Noid's done for the day. We're just going to let him go. Because everybody's an engineer, um, right? I'm I'm actually an engineer. That said, I have a ton of background as a PM. So I tend to run fairly large projects that reach across multiple teams because I have the skill set to be able to do that. Um, And I'm not an official lead, but I also kind of am a lead. Mm -hmm. Um, for our in-house pen test stuff, um, as well as our incident response and our, our SOC. Right. And I'd like to spend a lot of my time, but no, most of the time I'm spent triaging, you know, pen test findings, things like that, getting, getting code fixes done. Okay. And, um, and what I've found is that while I'm not directly empowered, I'm not the boss. I can't walk in and say, this is what you're doing this afternoon and get it done or you can't. Mm. Over time, I've built up enough credibility with the devs that I work with. And one of the things I found too is that by having clear repro steps to the issue works out well for me because when I can sit back and say, I reproed this issue, it's valid. Mm-hmm. That there for a lot of them goes, oh, okay, well, I mean, you know, he says it's valid and you know, we trust what he says. Right. And if anybody doubts it, they can go repro it themselves and go, okay, yeah, this is, I see where this issue is. I notice I, I have to fight and argue a lot less over the last couple of years right. that I've been at this role. Why? Um, mostly because I'm building credibility. Um, one of the things I've found is that the years I've spent working with devs is that if you also have a dev background, you sort of have, you kind of come in with a little bit like one of my, one of my coworkers is a former dev. And when he brings things up, he tends to get really good traction with the devs because from their perspective, okay, he's done our job before. And if he says this is an issue, it's an issue. Yeah. Whereas initially with me, it's like, oh, this guy's a security guy. He's, he doesn't have a dev background. Like, I don't necessarily jive what he said, but I've been right enough times that it's now created the situation where they go, okay, this guy has made it clear he doesn't like wasting our time. He's made it clear he doesn't like randomizing us. So if he comes to us and he says he can repro the issue and he's given us repro steps so we can repro the issue, odds are it's legit. Right. You know, and the big question at that point then comes down to is what timeline? Hmm. Do, we, do we need to drop everything and get it in this sprint or can, it, can we wait for the next major release? That kind of thing. But I, 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 I argue with people a lot less about the impact of the issue and more about the timing of the fix. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, is it being driven by... The other thing too is also... You know, I've I've stated this to people in the past that at the end of the day, if you don't have merit, leverage the company's ethos or leverage the driver for it. Like, for example, if I have a customer that says, you know, we're not, you know, we did a pen test. It's in our contract to do a pen test. We found this issue. 
and we're not going to renew until you fix it. Hmm. At that point, it's not a matter of whether or not you want to listen to me. It's do we want to retain this customer? Yeah. And, and you, even if the issue isn't really that, maybe, maybe the issue isn't really that big of a deal. Maybe the customer is making a mountain out of a molehill. But at the end of the day, if they say they are not going to renew until the issue's fixed, that's a hard fact. Right. Yeah, I, I've been working some gigs over the last six months because there's a major customer who is requiring uh, developers, companies with, you know, uh, plugins to their ecosystem to go through a security assessment for these specific API scopes. And, um, you know, that they're forcing, this company is actually forcing these small companies who haven't thought about security before to do security. Otherwise they're going to get shut off and they won't be able to do these integrations any further. Uh, some of them go kicking and screaming because some of the requirements is like, you must have policies like vulnerability disclosure policy or an SDLC or an incident response policy or whatever. And some of them are like, well, I'm, I'm a, two person company. I, I don't have any of this stuff. And you know, big insert, big company here's like, yeah, we don't give a shit. Uh, you're going to, you're going to abide by the rules of decent enough. You know, this bar security, sorry for you kids at home who aren't, you know, <laughs> can't see this. I'm, I'm, I've got a bar like here and then about two inches above it. I have like what real here. security might be. Well, yeah. really <laughs> I have the, uh, theater of the mind, man, <laughs> theater of the mind. Anyway. So this big company has decided this is what they consider to be the bar, the basic bar, you know, the, the minimum bar to play in their environment. And if you get higher than that, great. If you don't, you don't get to use their ecosystem anymore, which for some of them are like, this is going to kill us. You know, we, we can't do work. We can't do our job. We're going to go, you know, our company is going to go away because we can't use that. Um, but I think it's been a long time in coming. You're seeing companies like Google and Amazon uh, who have mentioned, uh, you know, uh, S3 buckets, like the Capital One breach. It was like, oh, you know, your your S3 buckets are allowing for all of this personal data to be stored in them. And Amazon's like, yeah, it works as intended. You know, it's up to the customer to, to you know, secure those. Uh, there's other companies out there. They're like, okay, you know, if you're going to use our stuff, you need to make sure that you're, you know, doing the proper secure checks and, and doing all that stuff. Um, is, is that a trend that we're heading towards where all companies that have these integrations are going to require this? Or is this just some one-offs that, that, that we're hearing because one, I, you know, work for the company that's work doing those. But I mean, is that, is that going to be more prevalent as we, as we continue through? I personally think that it is because mind you, I work at a, I work at a SaaS platform. Mm. So, you know, we are the third party. Y'all got integrations, right? Companies. Right. And we probably the number one piece of deal ceiling collateral we produce is our annual pen test report mm. because we have, we have potential customers come to us all the time <clears throat> with spreadsheets ranging anywhere from a dozen questions through 800. Oh, I fucking hate yeah. Questions. Yeah. Had one the other day, 800, man. Mm -hmm. which a little excessive, uh. but they, um, they all have these things because basically they don't want to be, they don't want their feet held to the fire. Mm. If they use my service. Right. And their customer's data gets out. Right. And so we see that in pretty much every single deal, there is at least some part of the deal where they say, Oh, and our security guys want to talk to your security guys. Cause we have questions. Mm. Right. And now we get to deal with it by being able to say things like, Hey, we have our SOC one, we have our SOC two, you know, some of that, some of that common language mm -hmm. means something to them, you know, Oh, we're ISO certified and that kind of thing. So now there's some common language there where they can go, okay, these cats are using standard frameworks. You know, they're meeting, they're meeting a, 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 bar, a very public bar. This one or this one. Yeah. Um, the other thing that drives a lot of it, too, is you'll see government stuff like FedRAMP requirements. And I've, I've watched FedRAMP requirements start to get rolled into non-FedRAMP environments right? Um, as, as well. And I think the, the big thing there is sort of having your ducks in a row, having that data available and ready to go. Uh, the other thing, too, that helps reduce some of that friction is um, from the from the developer side of the house, too, is automate. There are so many tools like you could, for example, uh, Ansible, mm. yeah. an Ansible playbook that says, hey, whenever there's a code check into the master branch of our repository, 
kick off a code scan. Mm, nice. Email the report to the following DLs. Right. Hey, can I riff on that for a sec? So uh, the last project that I had it was sponsored by DHS to try and put together these open source tools. I was using Ansible. And one of the requirements in the contract was testing. And so what I started doing to sort of take one step back, my background, computer programming, system administration. Mm. And I used to say back when I was doing security operations at the UW for like 30,000 Unix workstations, the best security is the best system administration. Right. And when you have a problem and you have to start debugging, if you know how to code level debug and system level debug and network level debug, you can solve things faster. So using something like Ansible, what we did in the playbooks that we had was using BATS, Bash Automated Testing System, integrate unit tests and system tests and some integration tests so that as you go deploy something with your automation, it's automatically testing itself. And yeah. as you're practicing or uh, updating the playbooks, that will give you some regression information. You can also then rely on these things as a partial security audit, internal audit. Are the things that I set for DNS still resolving the same way? Mm. You know, those kinds of checks. Integrating those things will increase your security significantly, and it will also make your devs and your sysadmins or site reliability engineers' lives easier. So I'm hoping that as people start going to the cloud, scaling massively, this idea of automation and testing will keep us from getting way, way out there on a whim. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I actually found the the article. So, or, I mean, I actually found some of the tweets. It looks like that person who had initially posted this about practical pen test labs, their account's gone. It says this I account saw that. that no longer exists. I wonder if somebody reported them for something and they, they got deleted or what have you. But um, there's still plenty of that on. Uh, there's still plenty of the original discussion online. So uh, his original post was like, "Oh, you know, you guys are stupid. You shouldn't be." you know, storing passwords in plain text. And then of course they doubled down. So this is like the T-Mobile Austria twit tweeter is like, what if we told you that's good for our, that is for our users. Good that it, they're trying to say, you know, we know what's good for the users. We don't allow users to choose their passwords. We don't store any sensitive information. Instead, passwords are randomly generated by the system and we need to store them in plain text so we can send you the reminder if you forget it. <laughs> And That's awesome. Of course, uh, some fine <laughs> gentleman from Cambridge, UK, said, Jesus Christ, what the hell are you talking about? If this is what you're actually doing, you need to stop using the internet. Which, I love me some British folk. They, they get succinct right there, you know. Uh, not the not hold back right at all. Right. And, and they come back and they go like, oh, well, we don't store any secure or sensitive information. But then uh, somebody had posted, I, I, it's somewhere in the tweet, thread that you know you have a profile inside there once you log in that allows you to do things like put your first name and your last name uh twitter handles and stuff like that and they're like that's just rife with social engineering and phishing you know send an email from you know pentesterlabs.org and say you know hey this is pentester labs log in and you know there's there's attack scenarios for using this stuff so yeah the the whole the whole link and the whole list here is just hilarity ensuing where they're <laughs> talking about you know if you don't allow users to choose your own oh the other thing was you can't ever change that password so the irony is oh, just great. lost on them yeah yep. yeah yeah so uh and, and because this is supposed to be teaching people how to do infosec uh, related uh hacking and penetration testing uh it's a it's a little it's very bad so um yeah uh mm -hmm. this stuff is literally the first five minutes on the first day of security 101 welcome to class i'm bob your instructor we're going to learn about web app security first thing you should know is don't store your passwords in plain text in your database so yeah that's <laughs> there's a there's a lot wrong there um and you know this is this is again kind of what we were talking about they didn't they don't think about the ramifications of this but maybe it was, you know, something that they generated a long time ago and it only started getting popular. Um, you know, they the communications in this case, and like we talked about last week with Keybase, um, they should have just owned up to, you know, being stupid and, and not, you know, doing proper best practices and fix it. But, you know, I think they still haven't fixed it or want to fix it. And 
Um, in this case, I hope it costs some customers because they're actually paying for this. Yeah. People are actually signing up to pay to use this system. And mm-hmm. um, God, uh, if they're storing, uh, they're, they said they're only using PayPal, so they don't have to store the credentials. So they're making an API call, at least, to PayPal, you know, um, to be able to, to make these payments. So it would be interesting to see if you have an account on there. Uh, how you keep paying for it, or if there's an API call that if you find somebody's password, can you continue making payments to their PayPal account in some uh, way, shape, or form? So, I mean, there, there's there's additional attack services that I, you know, don't want to go and ch- test. I'm not suggesting anybody else either, but... <laughs> yeah, there's just a whole bunch of fail here with these kind of things. And and we see them every once in a while. And some and people... it... Go ahead. Well, one of the, uh, and one of the hardest problems to fix is when you made a poor, to, poor security decision early on in your product development, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's sort of like anybody who's ever configured an AD, like an AD domain incorrectly. Mm. You realize real quick that basically like I have to stop what I'm doing, nuke it and start over now. Right. Because if I allow this to go forward, it is going to be just an impossible to fix, just absolute crap fest down the road. And you see this, that that legacy decision that gets hung around on a piece of software, like for whatever reason, we decided we were going to hard code some stuff in there that requires .NET 3, yeah. you know, or we're going to make a bad design decision. And then now later we've realized it's a bad decision. People have brought it to our attention, but fixing it is now this nightmarish burden. Yeah because it means having to go back and deal with, you know, some very subframe, you know, it's, 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 it's realizing the concrete in your foundation cracked after you built the house. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, you can fix it, but good God, like that's just going to be a nightmare. Right. And, and, and every company suffers from these. It's not always a security decision, but every company suffers from at least one poor decision that was made five years ago that they now have to basically work around on some part of their product right? because they don't want to do the heavy lifting necessary to go back and fix it for real. Right. So uh, Dave, uh, in response to that, is there any way to fix that or make that better or make that less, you know, sucky for, you know, companies to, you know, fix that .NET 3 or should they, should they not tie to any particular framework or, or version? I know that uh, people who tend to use Java a lot tend to use the, Java isms for a particular version, and then they get stuck on you know Java one six because well it has the the you know the call or the the API bit there that we need, and it would cost too much to upgrade to one seven or one eight or one nine. Uh, how can they how can they reduce the chances of doing that or having that happen to them in the future? Well, uh, I don't know if I'd call myself the expert in convincing people to do the right thing, but <laughs> the best <laughs> advice that I've heard from people in the past is to focus on basically rewriting everything, every major version, every couple of years, and just get yourself in the mindset of, we are going to throw this away. It's not going to live forever. Mm-hmm. And I've heard a few people who have started companies where the founder wrote the original code quick and dirty. Right. that they ended up living with for years and the technical debt incurred in that is just super huge. Hmm. So getting in that mindset of just let's burn it down and rebuild it frequently is about the only way to do that. But now how do you get people to make financial decisions based on that? Right. Right. Um, yeah. Especially if you're repainting your house every year or, you know, like Mr. Betcher, your, uh, log MD, it runs in what C, C sharp, C plus plus, something like that. Yeah. C plus plus C plus plus. Okay. So you're going to burn it all down next year and run it in Pearl. Rust. Ooh, that'd be a huge Go. effort. Rust. For, for one <laughs> On the night. Ouch. Of the- <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I wanted yeah, to go, put it in go. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much, it's like cancer. It's like, okay, I have a tumor in me. I don't want to Pearl? because it's going to be a, a nightmare. <laughs> but at the same time, what happens if I ignore that cancer? Well, right. guess what? Now I have lung cancer and liver cancer and pancreatic cancer and mm. bowel cancer because it's now metastasized. Yep. Yeah. And so sometimes you, have, sometimes you have to realize that like, okay, yeah, we done screwed up. This is a problem. But if we fix it now, it's going to suck. But if we fix it six months now, a year from now, it's going to suck yeah. so much more. Mm. Um, 
so well, that that is interesting because you would have to consider upgrading to the different versions of whatever to be potential new features, right? How, yeah. how, do, you, how do you frame that with your developers? It, well, you also you also have a problem there too. Of sometimes if you're leveraging like say these third party frameworks, every once in a while you'll have some thing that you need in that framework that yeah. is absolutely critical for your product, and the new version of Angular just came out and they got rid of it. Mm. Yeah. And it's like, oh, and a bunch of vulnerabilities got found in that Angular release. And it's like, well, we can't fix those vulns because the solution is to go to the new version of Angular, but it'll break our product if we do. Right. Right. Yeah, I saw that at a company I used to work for back in the past where, um, you know, they tried to build it after this came out and the Cassandra version they were using was using the older <laughs> version of Java, but the newer version of Java that they want to use doesn't work with every build. So we're just going to stay on one six Java for, you know, another six months. So, you know, yeah, until the heat death of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And that's and that's and that's one of those things. And that's something that people need to take into consideration when you're basically deciding that I'm going to cut out a bunch of work by leveraging this third party platform. It's like, okay, mm. cool. You've now taken a dependency on a thing yeah. you got off the internet, possibly for free. I mean, yeah, the, right. probably the biggest one out there that gets brought up a lot is curl. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Every, yeah. Everybody on the planet uses curl. Everything uses curl. Curl's yeah. written by one dude. Yep. Yeah. If he just decided to, you know, <laughs> toss it out the window one day, everybody's going to be, you know, shit out of luck, but somebody will fork it, you know, they'll put a Monero miner in it or something, you know, <laughs> important thing. Linux, Linux foundation was trying to solve that problem a while back, yep. by investing yep. money in the things that become part of the critical internet infrastructure. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Fact, I, I'll, also, Linux, I'll also I throw a out. Linux fund credit card. <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. And it gave cash back, but rather than giving the cash back to me, it threw the money, it threw that cash back into the Linux fund. Oops. And hundred percent behind that. I was like, yeah, by all means, we have to keep paying these people because if they ever get bored and decide to go get, you know, they're going to yeah. get Islamas or something like, guess what? We may have lost a critical piece of software. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So Miss Berlin, your SIM, uh, you guys are working on, uh, it runs in COBOL or something, right? Right. Yeah, right. totally. Right. Uh, so now there's lots of Python and other stuff i don't know i don't write code so i right. just leave that to the professionals <laughs> well my, my my question was because mr betcher's in c plus plus you guys are using python and whatever um moving or changing the technology stack could also require additional education from your developers um because, oh yes yeah. you know what if they all do go and it's like oh well python's so much better now we'll use python and we're like well we don't know how to use python or um you know there's going to be some education involved there um, uh, I guess my, my question is at, at what point do you go, okay, education for the new tech stack is also going to include security, uh, or, or should it just be, we need to learn the tech stack and let's go. I don't know. I, uh, I feel like we're lucky cause we have a really small group. We have like technical people. We have like eight maybe. And like our lead dev is also our lead security person. Okay. So, I mean, which makes sense for a sim, uh, I think. Um, so it's kind of built from the ground secure up. Uh, like every commit has its own code review and scan and all this stuff already combined and everything's like in containers and just super secure from the beginning. So our, our devs aren't super security people, um, but they kind of just work with the design that has been given to them, I guess. Okay. Did, so there, you said they're not necessarily security people, but uh, mm -hmm. did the, did the culture get created where they think in terms of security or is it just, we want to make sure that the, the, the lady doesn't get mean and, and hurt us. That would be you. Uh. <laughs> Every day that Amanda's not on my ass. I don't, ass work, is I don't a work good day. directly with the devs. So, right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's my boss's job. <laughs> ah, okay. All right. Um, yeah. And he's way smarter uh, than security and developing stuff than I am. So. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, so Mr. Betcher is entirely different. He's still the only developer. So, and he's also a security person. So he's a unicorn. Uh, he actually, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's yeah. fancy. So, um, when you're, you, you pick C plus plus Betcher, uh, Mr. Betcher, for what reason? Because uh, the app runs entirely in Windows, and that's the language of the operating system. So I can talk to it um, without having to translate anything or rely on any um, <clears throat> third-party stuff. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, you don't have to install Python to run the app. You just run it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, you, it's less yeah. less complexity in that case. So. And like ours doesn't matter because it's all in the cloud. Oh, well, that's right. good. You don't have to actually install anything. We all love the clouds. We, all, we have all the clouds. I love it. Right. Um, so other companies, maybe, I'm just looking through all of our notes here for this one. This one is a little less uh, little less uh, managed in terms of that. So uh, they say some people aren't, oh, I was talking about empowered teams. Some people aren't uh, happy with that. They, they, uh, the blog posts I have here, they were talking about how it's a nightmare to do, uh, empowered teams because there's no, there's no leader, you know, and the dynamic is, is never such that, uh, it actually takes more work to empower the team and not less because nobody is there to, you know, we're told to get everybody on the same page. Arguing continues as people tire and drop out and the last man standing wins is, is the, uh, the, the, the blog post I got here from, albeit August 31st of 2018. Um, so if you're in an, an empowered team, uh, should you should you try to create the dynamic of the leaders and the followers, or is that not the idea of an empowered team? I'm, I'm, I'm still a little lost as to why anybody would ever have the inmates running the asylum. Well, <clears throat> what I used to tell my goons at DEF CON, was in the absence of clear-cut command and control, it is your responsibility to assume command and control. Okay. And I think in a situation where you've got a team where there is a gap like that there and you are the person to fill the gap, it's your your, your sort of responsibility to step up and start driving those initiatives. Mm. So, for example, if I happen to be the security guy on one of these teams, then I'm going to step up and I'm going to lead it. Will I get any traction? That remains to be seen. That depends on how effectively I lead. Right. And the culture. And yeah. the culture. Mm-hmm. So when, uh, Mr. Noyd, when you mentioned that, you know, in the absence of leadership, you kind of have to shoot from the hip, uh, kind of reminds me of the Balance of Terror episode of uh, Star Trek, the original series, where, you know, Kirk's following the Romulan around and the Romulan's trying to go home and everything. And uh, they've got to go into the neutral zone because the neutral zone is the the area between the Federation and, and the Romulan star empire. And, you know, his orders are to not go into, you know, his standing orders are to not go there. But if he lets the Romulans go, they're going to go back and there's interstellar war. So, uh, Kirk was required to, you know, think on his own, do his own thing. And then three hours later, he gets something from Starfleet going, yes, we'll trust any decision you decide to make. Um, uh, or, you know, back in the day when uh, Navy sailing ships were, you know, didn't have communication like the British Empire, the, the captains on the ship were pretty much the de facto standard of, of, you know, they had some standing orders, they had some guardrails, they could go past a certain point. And then the um, only reason I remember this is I'm, I'm reading the Matcher and Aubrey series, uh, Master and Commander. Um, and so they have a specific guideline, you know, protect British shipping in this area and they do it however they feel they should, you know, prize crews will go and, you know, capture ships and stuff like that. So we're kind of going backwards in terms of how we do development, where it's like everybody has to kind of, you know, feel their way through. They get like specific standing orders, but you know, don't break the thing, but they, you know, they don't, they don't get any, uh, you know, overall leadership in this case. Well, you you may have hit on the the answer right there. Don't break anything. So right. the the idea of test driven development. If I was CISO, that's what I would be using. Mm-hmm. Is just get people in the mode of developing two tests. Write okay. the tests first. You, if you switch language, whatever. If it is conforming and the tests are passing, great. And then add security related tests mm. so that there's really no difference. There's just a test suite. Right. Test suite passes. 
great, you did your job. If it doesn't, then go fix it. Empower people to make sure that the tests succeed and then your product will succeed. Mm. Yeah, I just I just don't know. Uh, I need to. I'm, I'm actually asking um, the the guy who hit me up, Mark, uh, to to see if he'd come on the show and talk about empowered teams and stuff, because uh, it does sound a little buzzwordy. Um, but yeah, I'd like to discuss with him how they handle security in that case. You know, if it's just oh we got some hand wavy I'm here and all of a sudden security happens, then it's going to be like yeah we can't do that. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I, you know, I don't have anything else. Uh, anybody else have any questions, comments before we, we go? Okay. I do uh, not. All right. Excellent. So, uh, I'll, I'll go with Dave because we've never had him on the show first. He's our, he's our new guest. Uh, Dave, if uh, people wanted to talk to you about the history of distributed denial of service or ethics, because you were taught, uh, you were, you were, uh, at university of Washington, you weren't, were you teaching or were you just, you know, an advisor or what, what were you doing there? Well, I started out in the early nineties as a system programmer and system administrator okay. and then became the frontline Unix workstation support contact in the mid nineties, nice. okay. which became the security guy because before windows had a TCP IP stack, you break into a computer over the internet. It's a Unix system. Right. <laughs> and yep. then I wanted to get into research. So I was able to get myself in a staff research position, even though I only have a bachelor's degree. Nice. And from 2004 until two years ago, uh, brought in a little over $4 million and was able to go study the interesting things that I wanted to study, mostly botnets, uh, advanced malware tactics, trying to figure out how to lower the cost of doing response because forensics is hard. Automating that stuff makes it a little bit easier to do a better job of figuring out what happened. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So. Very cool. So if people wanted to discuss any or all of those things with you, is there a good way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, dave.dietrich at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, then that, I make it all kinds of spam. I should get a Keybase account and then it'll be really <laughs> super. <laughs> It'd be the teams. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. So, um, Mr. Noid, uh, if people wanted to talk to you about all things, uh, are you planning on being in DEF CON this next year? Um, it remains to be seen. There's other stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, the best way to get a hold of me is on Twitter. Okay. Underscore Noid underscore underscore noid underscore okay cool um yeah uh also if you are ever at csec east uh noid does tend to maybe once in a while show up uh so i'm trying to shame him into coming to the next one so oh we're gonna be yeah i know we're gonna be at unity in bellevue next uh, next month with uh, brandon and them Ooh. doing some appsec stuff so we're gonna be discussing some appsec stuff i haven't i haven't announced that on the the event bright or anything but yeah there it's there so um ms berlin Tell yeah. us, tell us about BeerCon and 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 what they were doing for you. I went really well. They did a twenty four hour stream. Um, it's uh, it was done by the Many Hats Club. Okay, They're a, a podcast mm-hmm. group um, out of London. I don't know somewhere in England. Yeah. Um, and yeah, they raised or are still raising. Uh, well, not by the time that this goes out, uh, they're trying to raise ten thousand pounds. Uh, to split between us and um, EFF. Okay. And they've gotten a little bit over six. So, nice. yeah, that was super good. They I, they had me on talking about mental health stuff. So oh, very I cool. was on super late last night. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I saw that and I was like, wait, that's GMT time. Wait, that's like like 18, is, you know, and I was like. <laughs> almost I, 11 p.m. my time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Okay. Which I mean. It's almost midnight my time now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was, I was I was trying to get this done before we all turned into pumpkins. So, uh, how would they get? How would people get a hold of you if they wanted to find out more about uh, mental health hackers and uh, and you personally? Um, you can DM uh, at Hackers Health or my Twitter is at InfoSister I N F O S Y S T I R. Uh, but you can't DM me unless she's got a, you got your DMs blocked. You know. 
It's the same yeah. reason that we would like Keybase to, yeah, same reason we want Keybase to lock down their stuff because, you know, <laughs> opening up DMs as a right. chick on the internet isn't great. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to say chick, Ryan, uh, as a lady in <sighs> tech. Lady, yes, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Betcher, uh, we, we mentioned BitlogMD earlier. Maybe you could tell people what that is in case they were interested in uh, using it. Yeah, LogMD does quite a lot now. We've been working on it for a few years. Um, one thing, well, the main reason we started it is, well, you know you need to start logging, right? But right. how do you start and what do you start logging? Well, let's just log the entire security log on the windows endpoint send them up to the cloud and and that's that'll that'll be good enough yep well logmd actually extracts something like 25 other logs besides the security log oh my and those are pretty high value uh, logs and it doesn't actually need the entire security log so it uh really extracts the things that are high value and uh low noise Okay. So that'll reduce noise on your um, your SIM, uh, your network traffic, your endpoints, and all that stuff as well. Cool. Um, so we do have a free version. So check it out if you if you have questions about how do I get started in endpoint logging, things like that. So there's no installation. Just put it on your system and see what happens. Cool. And how would people find you if they wanted to talk about that? I'm, my DMs are open on Twitter, and my Twitter account is at Betcherpwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. At least they're open for now. Must be I mean, nice. haven't had a problem with it. Um, or log-md.com. You can hit us up there. Okay. Um, I do have a question for Noid. Are, are you a uh, uh, human-rabbit hybrid, a.k.a. the... Uh, the uh, uh, mischievous rabbit-eared gremlin called Noid uh, yes. from 1986? Yes, yes, yes. My early career, I, I, I learned uh, <laughs> while I was going to college, I spent my time destroying pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, it's mean, more of a fetish thing, too. So it's a... Uh, oh, oh my. There I have a rich there. personal life. There goes our pizza. Pe- <laughs> rabbits rating. and pizza. Rabbits and pizza. <laughs> yep. Nothing says love like rabbits pizza. Anyway, so um, you can follow uh, BreakSec on Twitter at BreakSec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. And I'm on Twitter uh, personally, Brian Brake, B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. I don't have any cool Twitter handles or anything like that. Um, Just some quick housekeeping. If you want to join the Slack, we have uh, roughly 500 active accounts on there. We have a lot of cool people talking about fun things. We're very beginner friendly, noob friendly. We do have a code of conduct. So, um, you know, come on in. We do have moderators that watch and uh, we are at the point now where a lot of people self police. So um, we have a no politics requirement as well. Um, if that uh, interests you and uh, so far we have not had anybody, well, we've had one person get uh, banned. So um, I'm hoping that we don't end up, um, you know, having to do more but uh very noob friendly very friendly to people who are trying to break in the industry and uh, if you're interested in uh, joining that you can uh, dm us on our twitter at breaksec or you can hit bds.podcast at gmail.com and uh and ask for an invite and we will uh uh bring you in unless you're a crypto uh, bot or something like that and then <laughs> you know you will be de- denied um <clears throat> uh lay rate conference and- go ahead and poop put on your face. Yeah, we'll put poop on <laughs> on your avatar or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So um, Layer 8 Conference, uh, you can go to workshopcon.com. Uh, I did tell them I was going to maybe try to continue uh, uh, advertising this. They didn't pay us for it. I just, you know, it's a good, it seems like a good conference. And I believe Miss Berlin's going to be at it. Maybe. I probably won't. Uh, uh, our village should be, though. Uh, okay. My kid is leaving uh, for boot camp on June 8th. Oh, crap. So, yeah, I'm probably going to end up spending that weekend with him instead. Well, as you should. Okay. So, <laughs> um, layer8conference.com. Also, you can go to workshopcon.com forward slash events. Uh, they are doing scholarships. If you are looking to go and you are a 
a minority or a, a group uh, underrepresented in InfoSec, they are definitely trying to help out with that. Uh, layer 8 is a mostly social engineering and OSINT related topics. So if you follow WorkshopCon on Twitter and hashtag send me to layer 8 with the number 8, uh, you can uh, talk about why you're interested in doing that uh, on that Twitter, and they will select some folks uh, from the tweets with emphasis uh, from underrepresented minority groups. Uh, you can also, if you're interested in sponsoring it, go to sponsors at layer eight, number eight, conference.com. And uh, it's June 6th, 2020 at the Rhode Island Convention Center. So that seems like it's going to be fairly cool, and you, you can join that. So. Um, before we go, one last thing. Thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Uh, they help out with hosting fees, uh, just the time and effort to continue building our lovely community we have, uh, paying for the Zooms that we use for the various classes and the book, uh, book clubs and uh, CTF clubs and things that we're doing on our Slack. Um, and uh, we have a couple of new patrons, thanks to Scott and uh, I'm going to say Ian. I, it's spelled I-O-N, but I can't imagine it's Ion because it's not chemical in nature. Um, so Scott and Ian uh, are uh, some of our new patrons, and we appreciate all their help with that. Um, I think we're done. This was an awesome supercharged episode, and... Uh, um, I look forward to the hate mail from the key base folks. I'm, I, I told my people in my <laughs> office, I told the people at the office, I was like, if all of a sudden I can't use key base on Tuesday, it's probably because they That's listen to the right. podcast. So, um, yeah. Um, thank Maybe you. if you send them lumens though. <laughs> yeah. I'll send the <laughs> lumens back to the developers. Yeah. Of, uh, of key base. Anyway. So, uh, Mr. Betcher, thank you for coming on Miss Berlin as well. And uh, very special thanks to, uh, to Noid and Dave for, uh, for taking time out of their, their evenings to, uh, to come and chat with us on our show here. Hey, it was fun. Thanks for having me. Yep. Right on. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, that was it for breaking down security this week. Uh, have a great week. Be kind to one another. Uh, I know with the holidays, sometimes you can get down a little bit. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to a friend and, you know, talk through some of your problems if you're having any issues because, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, we, we're all in this together. And once we get past the holidays, it'll hopefully get better. But if you're feeling, uh, feeling icky or feeling, uh, you know, where you might hurt yourself, don't uh, hesitate to reach out. We have a mental health channel in the Slack channel if you, uh, if you have any have any negative thoughts so um yeah take care of yourself because you know you are the only you you have and uh we'll talk to you again real soon bye-bye thank you